Well, hey, Becoming Me. I am so excited to introduce you to my warrior friend, Mel. Mel, welcome to Becoming Me. I was so excited and I've been connected with you on social media for a while. So I've been looking forward to hearing your story because watching even just from a distance, what God is doing in and through you is so inspiring and encouraging to me. So just thank you for being you. You're awesome. Um, Yeah. And I think we should probably kick off with maybe the hardest, but I also think the most fun question. Like if someone's like, who's Mel? Like, who is Mel? Who am I? Yeah, girl. <laughs> um, okay, well, you want the church answer or you know, I want the like raw, real, we're at a coffee shop answer. Okay. Well, um, I would say other than um I feel like this is so lame, but being like sorry, maybe we can edit this part out. I feel oh, sorry. You're totally so, good. I guess I, what I'm trying to like go between is like when people ask me that I feel like um it's hard to say because the more I have grown I realize like who am I and it's it feels cliche but like I I'm who Jesus says I am and like that's who I am at my core but I don't want it to be like this churchy answer of like I'm a child of God but at the same time like that is who I am like it he's given me a lot of different attributes. So I would love to talk about that. But I would say at my core, like, I'm who God calls me to be. I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not um, um, a blonde. I'm not an American, like at my core, like I, yeah, I'm a citizen of heaven. And I would say that there are things that are about me, though. So I'd love to share that. Like, so I am actually not a natural blonde but (laughs) I'm was born in Phoenix uh lived there my whole life and um did a lot of traveling around um let's see Australia New Zealand Costa Rica um after college and then settled down here in San Diego and I've been here for the last four and a half years um what else about me I love to have fun I love deep deep conversations um I love, mm, what else? I love going to the beach um, and I, I just love growth and really helping people become who God intended them to be. Um, and so those are kind of just a few little things about me. I love that. And you know what I seriously, like truly love about how you just introduced yourself is you split the question, which is is very important to me because often we get asked like, oh, what do you do in terms of that's who you are? And so you first started with your identity, your identity at your core Mm -hmm. truly is. And it's not a churchy answer because you believe it, you've experienced it. You're a daughter Mm -hmm. of the king. You're a, a citizen of heaven, as you said. And I love that. Then you dove into some of the things that make you you and that are unique to you, but they don't define you, you know? And, mm-hmm. and so I love, love that you started with your identity and Thanks. the stuff that makes you. Yeah. So girl, I love it. I knew we were like soul warrior sisters. I, I, could, I could tell. <laughs> yes, girl, I love it. Okay. So obviously somebody's listening to how you've introduced yourself. And if they're anything like me, they're already curious, like what is Mel's story? <laughs> you know? And so now I want to know what's your story? What has made you who you are today? Oh, that's such a good question. Oh, man. So many directions I could go with this, but I would say a lot of what makes me who I am today is not only influenced by obviously my upbringing. I mean, I feel like that's very true for all of us. I was born in a Christian home and although my parents were not spirit filled um, type of Christians, charismatic or anything, I became a Christian at a really young age, um, and I just remember the Holy Spirit just, like, spoke to me, and I just remember just feeling this overwhelming feeling and giving my life to Jesus and being like, Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life, and I was, like, alone when it happened, Mm -hmm. and so it's kind of cool, like, when God calls us to himself, it's just, it's so true, like, he calls us to himself, and we get to respond, and so that definitely set a trajectory of my life, so I was at 11 years old of um, loving God and wanting to serve God and um, follow Jesus. And then in high school, I would say one of the big things of me becoming who I am is I got really plugged in with the church and I started reading my Bible and getting into a small group. And 
that started this trajectory of, you know, finding my identity a lot and being a Christian. And that was like who I was. I was a Christian and not in the sense of I'm a child of God Christian, but like I'm the good Christian girl Mm -hmm. and I do all the right things. And it was this, it was an interesting um, experience of being 16 years old. And I, I did read my Bible a lot and I did ask a lot of questions. And so feeling like I did know a lot more than my peers and, you know, was just more invested in my faith. And I think that while that was good in some senses, it also bred, I think, like a lot of pride. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, am I the only one who cares this much about Jesus? And I didn't really have a lot of Christian friends in high school, it was a small high school. And, and so um, that kind of set a trajectory of not um, finding Christian community as much. And then going into college, still didn't really find a lot of Christian community. Um, And that, I think, I think in that, in that time period, I was, I was in a sorority and I remember one other kind of defining moment for me was having a roommate that was just really sat me down and was really honest about just different places that I fell short where I was inconsiderate and where I, um, did things out of selfishness. And that was like a blow to me. So I was like, I'm like, I'm the church girl. I'm the Christian girl, you know, especially like in the sorority being like one of the only Christians too. And I think seeing her grace for me in that moment of I've seen everything that you've done that is kind of like cringy. And I remember feeling so much shame because I was like, oh, I didn't even, I didn't even realize I did all these things. And, but she loved me afterwards. And I was like, oh, that's, that's what grace is. Like, cause I used to be like, I, I kind of nail it. <laughs> I thought so pastors would be like, everyone struggles with pride. And I was like, not me. <laughs> like how ironic and just, yeah, her, her ability to give me that grace. And, um, and that, that was another kind of trajectory that kind of went more towards like, what, like, what is Christianity? Cause I thought it was this thing of just being a good person and doing the right things for God. And then I was like, Oh, well, I'm more of a, I'm a sinner. I need grace. Um, and then towards the end of college, I kind of transitioned uh, into kind of a phase of my life where I started questioning God's goodness because I didn't have that Christian community. And so, you know, we're all, we're all meant for community and we all crave community. And so if we're not getting it, we're going to go to the places where we can find it and where I found it was in worldly friends and don't ever underestimate the power of the people you put around yourself because I started falling into, you know, getting drunk and going out on the weekends and it was a really fun time, but also realizing, um, like a few years into it, of like, this is so empty and I know what, I know what it's like to have Jesus. And even if I will never have mm. Christian fun friends, that is better than this experience mm. of, of partying and being drunk and then hung over the next day and then feeling bad and not wanting to go to church because I feel bad. And, um, and so it was actually at that point that I moved to Australia and I kind of just had a clean slate. And I was like, okay, I need Christian friends. And I wanted to learn to surf too. So I actually got involved in Christian surfers. And it it was like the coolest group of people. They were surfers, they were Christians, they were Australians. And so they were already kind of like wild and fun. And so that was huge for me of being like, oh my gosh, Jesus, Jesus wasn't just trying to take our fun away when he's, when he says, do this, don't do that. It's that, wow, this is the true life that Jesus comes to bring, the John 10, 10. And the thief being, you know, the enemy, anything that's not of God only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And I really saw that in my life about the drinking and the partying and being like, nothing good came out of that, you know? And and while I don't have like shame around it, I'm also like, those are wasted years. And it taught me God's goodness. I think God is so good that he will use those things. Yeah. But we should never be confused in thinking that, oh, let me go sin so that I can know how good God is. Because, right. you know, there's there's always consequences. And so I just, I learned a lot about God's goodness in those those years in, in Australia and New Zealand and then shifted into, um, fast forward a few years, I then lived in Costa Rica and I was um, a missionary there and I it was interning for a church. And it was one of the hardest seasons of my life because I was working for someone who we just had totally different personality types. And um, 
And it, it was like we just constantly clashed and constantly miscommunications and me feeling like I'm trying to please her and nothing I can do can please her and her feeling like I'm not following directions. And, and to a certain extent, I don't think I was <laughs> looking back now. And, you know, with so much growth and being like, okay, yeah, I can fully see your point of view. But that's when I started really digging into like personality types and, um, you know, what makes people people. And, and I started uncovering things and, and started listening to the podcast, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality mm -hmm. uh, by Pete Scazzaro. I don't know if you've ever, have you yep. heard of that one before? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was life-changing for me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We started talking about looking into your family history. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this, like, mm, I don't know if I'd buy this, but I'll buy, you know, and, um, and talking about how important emotional maturity is and emotional, um, yeah, maturity. And, and you can't be emotionally mature, sorry, spiritually mature without being emotionally mature. And I just kept listening to this podcast, podcast, and just my eyes started opening up to all the different ways that I just was so unaware of oh my gosh, like I don't have rhythms in my life. I don't, I don't, I had never thought about how my mom's perfectionism has passed down to me. Now I struggle with perfectionism and um, just different things. And, and um, then more recently, about four years ago, I started, um, actually it's so funny. I have um, the booklet right here. It's called Women's Skills. Oh, that's cool. It. But it's, it was, it was the most life-changing thing for me. And it was held at a church. And I thought it was just going to be like a Bible study. So I'm like walking into it. And I was like, oh my gosh, we're going to learn how to be a Proverbs 31 woman. This is so <laughs> stupid. You know, like not as stupid, but I'm just like, Ugh. and I walk in and they're like, this is a safe space. Um, if you feel triggered, let us know. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be so trouble. <laughs> and, uh, and, but I was like, whatever, I need community. You know, I just moved to San Diego and it, changed my life we went into just our family history even deeper our triggers um and because I walked into it thinking I don't have I don't have any triggers or sorry I don't have any trauma mm -hmm. I grew up in a great Christian home my family never hit me it was never sexually abused was never this that the other I don't have any trauma so I mean maybe I can learn something to help other people but nothing for me and as towards the end of the class I started kind of cracking a little bit and hearing other people's stories about how their parents maybe showed them comfort in some ways. And I was like, huh, I don't know if I ever got that in that way and, and other things. And, and we had to make a list of everybody who hurt us. And I remember I never like in our life, we had to do a trauma timeline, all of it. Wow. And I never wrote down my parents and my facilitator pointed that out. She's like, that's interesting. You didn't write down your parents. And I was like, huh, I don't think I'm ready to. And I realized there was, there was something I was holding back. There was, there mm -hmm. was something in my history that I didn't want to look at because of, it felt too painful. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I'm not really passionate about of helping people all, all realize that all people realize that we all have a story mm -hmm. and we all have story of pain and trauma in our past. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, after taking the class, I took it again. And then I got certified to facilitate it. And then I took the women's skills too. And I just started digging into this. So I was like, I need to learn more about myself. And because I, you know, I didn't have good friends at, at when I first moved to San Diego four years ago. I didn't, I felt like I didn't, um, I didn't know how to be a good friend. I didn't know how to keep lasting friendships. I didn't know how to find friends that I actually wanted to be friends with. And it just felt so disappointed with friends. And I remember I was talking to my roommate one time and I was like, why do I keep having friends like this? Like, you know, who let me down and, and with guys too, guys who aren't interested in me that I'm interested in, well, this is just happening to me. And she just pointed out to me, she goes, no, you choose them. And I was like, I was like so hurt. I was like, what? She's like, you're choosing these friends. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, I'm not. Like, it's just who I have. And she's like, you actually get a choice of who your friends are. And that was, I had to chew on that one for a while. And then I read a book about alcoholics and their partners um and learned about codependency and about how people who sometimes appear perfect yeah. or whatever they will partner with somebody who has a lot of problems uh -huh. because it actually distracts them from their problems because they're working on their partner's problems mm -hmm. and so I was like whoa that just opened my eyes because I think I grew up with a victim mentality of things mm -hmm. just happen to you and you just you deal with it the best you can and not that you have a real choice in your life mm -hmm. And that was so powerful for me. 
And I realized, wow, what other areas in my life have I been just thinking I don't have, I'm powerless. Mm-hmm. And um, so as I'm taking these women's skills class, I got into my first relationship with, you know, an adult romance. And I just remember, I just had so much anxiety and I just couldn't, I couldn't like figure out why I'm, I never have anxiety. Like why am I having panic attacks right now? And, yeah. and then, so took that time where, um, where I could have just said, this isn't God's plan for me. I'm not feeling peace about it. Let me just run. But instead I chose to work with my facilitator. And I was like, let's get down to the root of this. Let's figure out what, what is this problem? Let's not try to numb it with, you know, medication or, let's really dig into it. And I just went so deep in my, um, my childhood. I remember starting asking my parents questions like, Hey, what was I like as a kid? Um, what do you remember it to be? And realizing we remembered very different things. And, Oh, did you remember this, this friendship falling apart with this work, this girl? And they're like, Oh, kind of, but I just remember you were a really tough kid. And I was like, interesting. Cause I remember crying about that a lot. So then I had to think back. I was like, that meant I probably cried alone and I probably didn't feel comfortable coming to my parents or feeling like they just would want to fix the problem instead of actually giving me empathy and comforting me in that moment. And, and just realizing like, Oh man. And the the hard part about that is when you look back at your parents and you have this image of them that they're like perfect. Mm -hmm. And then you start to realize the ways that they actually wounded you. It's a really uncomfortable feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's because I think we are wired to keep that bond really strong because as kids, we will die without our parents. Mm -hmm. And so we have to keep it strong. And so it's not like that mentality switches just because you turn 18. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really painful thing because you almost feel like you're going to (laughs) die if if you point out something with your parents. So a lot of people tell kids Mm -hmm. for survival, they create this bond, uh, this fantasy bond in their head of saying, oh, no, no, it was something I did. Like I was the wrong one in anything. And And the thing is, our parents are not perfect. And so they they've all made mistakes they've all hurt us intentionally and unintentionally Mm -hmm. and that just makes them human it doesn't mean they're bad it means they're not god and so i think it's every i think it's important for all of us to go back and go through this process of realizing the ways that we've been hurt because at the end of the day we're going to pass that on to our kids because we just don't know any better yeah and so that's what has really shaped this now like passion that i have for um, for helping people again look into their stories of trauma and realizing the ways that they are maybe ignoring some pain because that actually had an effect on me of yeah. then thinking that I was there was something wrong with me mm-hmm. of when I would maybe bring something to them and they would just be like oh well just you know just do this or do that instead of giving that empathy and that comfort that a child needs I'm like oh well I need to, that, like these, these things, these solutions, like maybe ask less questions, maybe talk less, maybe this, that, you know, that God's given me those giftings actually becomes, um, I, I, I hear a lie. It says those things are bad. Those mm-hmm. things are shameful and those things you need to curb and stop doing. And so I just walked around wounded all my whole life until, you know, four or five years ago of thinking, talking is bad. My curiosity about others is bad. Um, I ask too many questions. I'm, you know, annoying those, those type of yeah. false identities. Mm-hmm. And then and that would affect the way that I go in relationships, because I don't know if, if you've ever um, experienced this, or I'm, I'm sure other people have, and they told me they have, you walk into a situation, everything's going great, but then you get kind of a weird glance or somebody maybe doesn't laugh at your joke or mm-hmm. you feel wronged in some way Mm -hmm. then your brain immediately tries to figure out why and it goes to those lies it's like oh well it's because you talk too much oh it's because you ask too many questions oh it's because and so I realized then that makes me defensive against them and I'd be like oh I need to now hide I'd be defend and hide because I'm about to get hurt and then I would start acting weaker towards them and it would just be this spiral and, and in your head, you're, and then you just feel worse and shame and that. And then you start isolating, you get weird against those people. And, and then they're just like, oh, like I got a text message and I looked up and I was, you know, like it's probably has nothing to do with you. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And, and so I would just find myself in these cycles of like great at first, it would start cycling down. And then I would be like, I, I would feel pushed out. 
But in reality, it was because of my mindset about how I felt about myself. I, I self-sabotaged mm-hmm. and pushed myself up. It was never super bad or anything, but it was like these subtle things enough for me to feel feel like, oh, I'm alone. I don't have any friends. Nobody likes me, mm-hmm. you know, and and before it was brought to my attention of any of this, I, I just thought that's how life is, you know, and, and I just don't connect well with people. So anyway, fast forward to where I was, you know, three or four years ago, I'm going through this, I'm going through this relationship Mm -hmm. and all this stuff is starting to be brought up of, oh, maybe I didn't get the comfort that I needed as a kid or, or, and it doesn't make my parents bad parents. They can be both good parents and, and bad parents at the same time and be overall amazing parents, which they are. And there's so many amazing things about them that, you know, they have such good integrity would always do the right thing. We eat family, I eat dinner as a family, every meal, so many things, but that doesn't negate what they've done that wasn't right either. So anyway, did a lot of, of healing of, of that. And, and actually it got worse for it got better. So with my family, it, it got really bad with my parents and me. And, um, but my parents hung in there with me and, you know, I would have so many crying phone calls, screaming at them, you did this, you did that. And, and thank God for their grace on my life. And then, you know, first they were defensive, but they, they allowed this, this exchange. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we listened to some other uh, podcasts and, and did one of their, like um, their courses okay. called, uh, it's called the father series. And um, my mom actually bought it. And it was basically this course that you go through like your father wounds, but my mom got three booklets, one for me, one for my mom, one for my dad. So we went through it together, mm-hmm. which I mean, that's super vulnerable of my parents to be like, okay, let us know what, you, what we did so we can apologize and make this better. And just the reconciliation that we've had over the last few years and, and hearing my dad say the things that I never heard him say growing up of, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. And like, I, you know, I, I, I should have, I should have said those things and I didn't, and I'm sorry. And, and also as I was, um, I also went through a breakup with that same guy that I started dating and that brought up so much, you know, pain and and abandonment reminders and (laughs) rejection wounds. And you're like, oh yeah. And and realizing how much of that is linked to, to father wounds, to mother wounds, and then being able to go through that, that breakup and healing process with my parents as I'm healing my relationship with my parents. And, and inviting them into that because they're ready to, to give me that comfort was just the most beautiful thing. And um, so I'm, I'm really passionate about using dating as actually, you know, while we're in this season of dating, if we're single, it's not our preferred season, typically, you know, if you're over 25 in Christian, usually. <laughs> But it's like, here we are. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to be sad? And like, you can't, you can hold both. You can hold, you can be sad and you can be hopeful, you know, right. but it's like, okay, well then how do I use where I'm at to my advantage? And for me, it's let's use the pain of getting rejected from that guy or getting ghosted from that guy. Let's use it as a way to grow and a way to actually like get triggered and dig into those triggers. And, you know, with like, um, you know, a friend or a mentor or a counselor, um, because I mean, that's where I found just so much profound growth and healing and just going back to kind of the mindset things of like, I'm this, I'm that, I'm not good. I'm, I'm bad. I'm annoying. I realizing that's the reason why I couldn't, I didn't have friendships. Like that's the reason why also I you know, I found myself on the side of codependency of needing people mm-hmm. and I would seek out more empathetic people, but then it would, it would, I would feel like we're so close and then only to find out that, oh, they don't think we're that close because it was never reciprocated. It was just, I just took and I didn't give. And mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, I was scared of intimacy because intimacy is a, a give and take mm-hmm. back and forth, not just a one way. And they were equally as scared of intimacy, but it worked for them because they just wanted to give. And so you, whoever's listening is likely going to, you know, if you're finding yourself not being able to connect with all people, you'll probably find yourself in one of the two camps, either you give all the time or you take all the time and they're equally toxic. Um, And so I just had to, I, I just realized as I became healthier, as I dug more into the reasons why I was the way I was, what created that, the lies. I was able to then replace it with truth and say, okay, I know I feel like, or I'm thinking, 
oh man, my, you know, talking is, is annoying and rephrasing it and being like, this is a gift that God's given me of being outgoing. I remember one time I was filling out a survey at, um, at like a counselor's office when I was really, really young because my parents took me to counselors because I thought it was stupid. Um, so that was really nice of them that they brought me there. But um, I just had really smart friends and I just remember everyone around me was just so smart and I, I thought I wasn't that smart. So anyway, I'm filling out this, this survey and, um, and one of the questions was, do you find yourself being able to talk with strangers as if you're old friends? And I just felt this like shame come over me because I was like, oh my gosh, I do that. Thinking that it was a bad thing. Uh-huh. And I remember being like nine or 10 years old and being like, I will never do that again. I made this vow to myself. I will never talk to strangers as if they're my friends because my parents are, they're more introverted. And so I was always this kid who they're like, well, we didn't know where you came from. You were so outgoing and extroverted and you talked to everybody in the grocery store. And I'd be hearing these stories and what they meant as terms of endearment for me that I felt shame about that because I was different from mom and dad. I was different from, I remember when I was um, young, there was this like foster shark in the liquor section, like this big inflatable shark. And I was like, mom, I want that. And, she, and I was probably like eight and she was like, well, it's like not for sale. And I was like, well, can I ask if I can have it? And she's like, I guess if you want to. So I was like, where do I go? She's like, I guess like customer service. I walk it up to customer service and say, can I talk to the manager? <laughs> and she's like, okay. And she's like, uh, how can I help you? I was like, can I have that shark over there? And she's like, I guess like the promotion's over. Sure. She got a ladder and she cut it down for me. <laughs> And I was like, and I walk up and I was like, oh my gosh, they gave you the shark? And I was like, heck yeah, it's a sick pool toy. And <laughs> awesome. so I got it, you know? So I was bold at a young age and it just didn't cross my mind. But sometimes the way our parents act or react to stuff, even if it's so well-intentioned, like they thought it was so cool. But in my mind, I was like, like, they don't think it's that cool, but I'm going to do it anyway because I'm bold. But, you know, so then fast forwarding, I'm, I'm reading this this survey and yeah I'm like and then realizing like yeah I made a vow when I was eight years old I will never talk to strangers as if I'm old Mm -hmm. friends with them and it's been hard for me now you know to to connect with strangers in the same way because um until more recent but because I actually made that vow and and realizing when we make vows when we're young yeah that's actually we're making an agreement with demonic forces to come alongside of them and agree with them. And it's the spirit of shame is whispering to me, like, you will never do this again. I'm like, yeah, I'll never do that again. And we actually, um, we don't realize how powerful our words are. You know, it says in the Bible that the power of life is in the tongue. And so life or death is in the tongue. And, and in that moment, I, you know, I've had to repent of that. So yeah. later on, I've had to repent and be like, oh, I'm so sorry that I, you know, took a gift that you gave me and I partnered with the enemy to say it wasn't good and I repent I'm going to turn from that and I'm going to say thank you for the gifting you've given me and I'm going to walk in that and so you know that that changes things when we repent and mm-hmm. turn turn towards God um and so so I just had to do that for a lot of different um different things and lies that I've, I've come into agreement with about myself and so I have this this list on my mirror now and it's like truths about who I am and it's I'm not too much. I'm beautiful. And my, my one that hits for me is I'm chosen. Mm. And, and I always say with girls that I'm talking to, I'm like, no, that if guys, that feeling you get is that like high that you get when a guy or, or girl or you're a guy um, is like, I like you or like you're hot or you're, you're cute or whatever. You're like, yes. Like you're like, oh, I just, <laughs> you feel so great. Cause you feel yes. so chosen mm. or, or they're like, or like, who do you like the most? And they're like, Oh, Mel, like, you know, or are you, you're the only one that they pick. It's just like, you feel so chosen. (laughs) And I, I realized when they just clicked, I'm like, wait, that high that I feel that makes me like Mm -hmm. reinforces in my head. Like I am a person that gets chosen because I, I'm like, that's actually who I am. Like God chooses me. And so I can feel, not that I'll feel that high all the time, but I can feel like the results of that high of that. I'm, I'm worth being chosen and because that's because I am chosen like I am the popular girl like I am the hot girl like that that type of confidence I get from it that then goes away when it's from humans because if the next person doesn't choose me then I'm like oh I'm not chosen again I can walk around with that same like Mm -hmm. energy and that same 
um, confidence because yeah. that's who I am. And that has has been these these truths in my identity is what have like just changed everything for me. And then, you know, going back to that example of you walk in and you group of friends and they look at you funny or they um, you know don't laugh at your joke or whatever, you know, once once I was able to really get those truths, not in my head, but just in my heart too, both, then I'm able to look at them and be like, that's okay if they don't think I'm funny. That doesn't mean I'm not funny. God thinks I'm great. That may be really funny. And not because anybody's ever, you know, confirmed or denied that, but because God does. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so being like, that, that's a lie that I'm not going to partner with, that I'm not funny or that people don't like me. And slowly I started seeing my friends change and seeing healthier people like coming around me and staying around me. Like it would, it would be like, I couldn't get that. It would always be like, I couldn't get that friend that I really wanted that really cool friend that like, not just cool and like they're cool, but um, that they were healthy and that like people liked them and they were, you know, they were well liked because they were healthy. And so it's just, God has just transformed my life through really rooting down into what those lies were, transforming them into truth. And now I find myself being in situations where I'm like, I have too many friends, like too many people who want to hang out with me. And I don't say that in like a boastful way, but mm-hmm. coming from me, you know, feeling like I was a beggar, just get what I can get, you know, whoever, whatever friends that want me, I'll take, um, to now being in this position of, man, I have my, you know, three, two or three really close friends. I'm working on my business. I don't, I don't have a lot of time to invest in other friendships at the stage of life that I'm in right now. And, um, but always getting invited to stuff and people asking like, Hey, let's get coffee. Hey, let's do this. And, and now it, it's just a different stage of, of being like, Hey, how do I guard my time better? I never thought I would be there ever. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so that's, that's, those are, those are a few, you know, long-winded ways to say, and that's what's made me who I am. I love the fact that you walked into this Bible study and were like, yeah, been here, done that. Like I'll learn something to help somebody else. And like, God yeah. completely transforms you. Like, wow. That's amazing. You know, Mel, I've got to know, um, cause so I love how you mentioned too, like people ask you to coffee. So right now, like, let's just go on a virtual kind of coffee moment. Right. First, are you a coffee drinker? I do like coffee. Okay. Depends. Okay. So but how do you no drink your coffee then? Oh man, lots of sugary stuff with just a little bit of coffee. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> about you? Oh, I. It depends. In the morning, I will drink it black. Like that's just how I start okay. the day. And then mm-hmm. I'm a fan of pumpkin spice lattes, like all the sugary mm-hmm. goodness in the afternoon. I'm just yes. So yes. But if you were at a coffee shop with someone else, you've ordered your very sugary, delicious coffee. They have their Mm. coffee of choice. You're sitting down and you're just wanting to encourage them on their own becoming journey. What would you say? Ooh, Ooh, I love it. Oh man. (laughs) Sorry. Excitement is too real with this sugary coffee. It blew the, it blew the circuit. (laughs) Can't take it anymore. I know. I love it. Um, oh man, I would, well, I would ask a lot of questions first, you know, I just, and I I really always want to get down to like, what, what do they really believe about themselves? What's really, um, bothering them? What are their pain points? Because I think a lot of times we think as Christians, like we need to, um, you know, share, share Bible verses or share encouragement, share about our own story, which we do. But I think a huge part of even discipleship and, and being a good friend, mentor, whatever is listening and hearing somebody out sometimes that alone is more healing than whatever you could yeah. share with them I know that as I I have a dream of being a marriage family therapist someday and, and I'm going to start moving into coaching soon um with um you know the girls going to the dating thing basically if they have trouble making friends deep friendships and just walking them through that I'm about to get started I'm kind of creating content for that I'm really excited but what I've learned through, you know, my own journey and realizing, oh, what was given to me a lot of times was tips and was maybe try this, maybe try that. Let me encourage you here, you know, for my parents and realizing what I really needed was just attunement and something to hold space for me and just be however I was, be yeah. mad, be sad, be angry, 
you know, just be and, and not judge me for it. And just let me sit there for a second and not try to get me out of it, yeah. you know, because so often there's just so much in our bodies that we are so disconnected from, especially in the church world, because we've been not told a lie because the Bible's truth, but we sometimes almost use spirituality and use the Bible to jump out of our pain, yeah. to get away from pain. Yep. But God never said pain was sin. No, there's lots of stories about long suffering and lament and grief. That's that's actually a huge part of the Christian life. In the Old Testament, you see them throwing ashes on themselves, ripping their clothing. Like mm -hmm. that's what they did. We don't do, we like cry for a minute. We're like, okay, I'm healed. Let's go. Like, <laughs> and it's like, there's no way that's like, mm -hmm. no, that's not healthy. And um, that's not that's not how God designed us. Um, I would say I. I a lot of times want to take them to their pain and, and kind of give them permission to enter into that pain and just be, and say like, I'm here with you in your pain and I'm here with you in your anger. And that makes a lot of sense that you'd feel angry. Mm -hmm. Totally makes sense. And it totally makes sense that you feel sad about that. Mm -hmm. Totally makes sense that you're discouraged that you're single because all your other friends are, are married mm -hmm. and you're the last one. Oh my gosh, that sucks. And I'm so sorry. That's what's going on for you. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's a, it's a both and of, being able to sit with them in that and then also kind of just testing where they're at because if people don't have the ears to hear it sometimes it's not the kindest thing to jump into the fixing or the the solution of stuff but if you never give them a solution or never give them encouragement and remind them of the truth then you know you don't want anybody to stay stuck in there but I usually will will let them kind of go through that and then you know offer be like can I share some you know my experience or you know, what's helped me before. And then, you know, you're like, yeah. And, um, and then that's when I try to just share, like get down to identity stuff. Cause at the end of the day, like it's like, it's always identity stuff and, and, and um, identity and also what we believe about God. So yeah. we, what we believe about ourselves and believe about God. So usually it's, we don't trust his goodness. God isn't really good because if God was good, I'd have a husband. If God was good. I'd have kids. If mm -hmm. God was good you know, I would, I would be more financially stable in my career. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it really goes back to being like, well, if God is good, which he is, and if it's true that God withholds no good thing from those who walk up righteously, it's like, well, either you're not walking up righteously and you have areas where you need to repent, or you need to figure out the lies that you have partnered with that are, you know, and, and get some freedom from that, get deliverance, get, um, you know, get right with God because that is going to mess you up so much more than like anything else that you can do or be better at. Um, and then also get right about your identity and, and who God calls you are. What are you saying? What are your thoughts? That's so huge. What is your self-talk? That, that was my big point too, like practical steps of how I actually started changing. And it was called kind of this idea of reparenting mm -hmm. of, okay, I maybe didn't get this as a kid and this has brought me to be who I am today but it's my responsibility to, to get the healing and to walk that out because you can't, you can't change where you came from. You're not right. responsible for what happened to you, but you are absolutely responsible and you get, you're powerful. And that's something with women. I'm, born, I'm like, you are so powerful to change your destiny. You, you live in a small town in the middle of nowhere and you're sad. You can't find a husband. I'm like, why don't you move? Like, that's not always going to be the, the solution for everybody, but kind of this just victim mentality that a lot of women have, especially in people in general, of like, I can't change my solution. Uh, like I, I want to stay where I'm at. I'm not willing to shift anything. And that makes me a victim. And you're like, you're not a victim to your circumstances. So really trying to encourage a friend of like, just how powerful they are. You have choices. That's what you're saying about yourself. Your situation isn't the truth. Like let's fill it with some truth. Let's find yeah. out what those truths are. Um, and, and stop speaking to yourself like that. And even with my friends, they'll be like, I, I never, I'm so dumb or I never, I don't know, get it right or whatever. I'm like, Hey, don't say that. Say you feel dumb. Cause that's okay. You feel dumb mm -hmm. and say, it feels like I'm not getting this right. Or I'm experiencing this, or I did this, but don't say that to you are because your words matter. Mm -hmm. Don't partner with the enemy. Mm hmm. Oh, my goodness. I love this so much. This fall at my church, our pastor has literally been teaching us you validate your feelings, your feelings are for real, your emotions are for real, validate, mm -hmm. then you challenge and change your thinking. 
And so everything yes. you're just talking through there, I'm like, yes, like, ah, oh, I, I absolutely love it. You know, you mentioned you have a business and you have some potential coaching launching. Tell us about the business. Tell us, tell us more. You bet. So, um, my business is if you know, you know, dating and our mission is to bridge the gap between the church and single Christians who want to meet other single Christians and hope to get married. So it started off at the beginning of 2021, uh, more just like a like a passion project. Just let's just throw some speed dating on. Like my friend and I, uh, we always wanted to do speed dating, and so we're like, let's do this for real. And so we just got a lot of our friends together, had them invite friends. It was like real real low price point just to cover the cost, and ended up getting like 90 people to come together for a weekend. We did it three different days and some different age ranges. And people are like, this is amazing. When are you going to do it again? And I was like, oh, I didn't really think we we're going to do it again, <laughs> but why not? So I just did it a few different times in 2021. Then at the end of 2021, someone's like, you should try a mixer event, get it a little bit bigger because you can only really do 15 and 15 for speed dating because it's just exhausting uh, after talking to that many people. And so, like, okay, so then tried this mixer and, and it was a hit. And so around that same time, this is the end of 2021, I was applying to be a therapist, marriage family therapist, uh, to get my master's degree. And I, um, you know, was preparing for that, writing all the essays. And then I felt like at the end of the end of the year, God was just calling me to give like a big donation to church. Okay. And I was like, God, really? Like, I want, I'm about to go to school and, and God knows I'll have to take loans out and I would like to use some savings and, and he's like, give, give an even bigger sum, give an even bigger sum. And then, at, and then at one point he's like, how much do you trust me? I'm like, I trust you. He's like, give, give all your savings. I was like, what? All my savings? Like, that's crazy. And, um, but our pastor had just been sharing all these stories about radical generosity. And I've seen it in my life too, of God coming through for me in so many ways and providing for me that I was like, you're too good. Like, you're not going to leave me empty handed. You're just not. And it, it talks about how, like, I believe in Proverbs about, you know, you're never going to starve because you gave somebody else food or you gave too much. And I think when we do it with the right heart, I mean, if God really is a good dad and he really does provide for all our needs, mm -hmm. we will not starve. I, I, I love reading stories about missionaries. Um, and there was one in being Egypt and they have an orphanage and they literally like, so there's like hundreds of kids and and they they didn't have any food and they're about to eat dinner and so she said we're gonna we're gonna do it just like we always do it we're gonna walk to the dinner table or the dinner room and we're gonna pray and god's gonna provide for us and so all the kids walk in she knows there's nothing in the kitchen nothing's been cooked and um or i, I remember who it was maybe it was a guy missionary but anyway they walk in and they're sitting down they do their prayer and they hear a doorbell ring and they're like, what? They go to the door and it's like their local baker. And they're like, we baked too much bread this, this today. And we wow. have some soup that we didn't sell. And we thought maybe you guys would want it. Yeah. Like, come on, God. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh. That's what gets me stoked of like, mm. wow. Like nobody would ever have seen that coming and being like, God, I want to give it all to you because I'm stoked of how you're going to provide for me and how much I'm going to grow in my relationship with you and how much my, I can just trust you. Cause it's usually like, I think about that bread would be so expensive to like, and it was like nice bread too, you know, and, and this really nice meal that you're like, and it's not just, Oh, I'm going to give it all away so I can get cool free stuff. But to a degree, it's like, that's, that's not easy to do that. That does take a lot of faith and, and you get to see God show up in so many ways. So I was like, okay, God, what I had to lose, let's do it. So I gave it all away and, um, and uh, had a friend keep me accountable for it, shed a little tear and, and I was like, okay. And so around that same time that I gave the money, I also made a TikTok for, um, if you know, you know, dating. So we were doing these events and I was like, maybe we could go to like other cities, you know? And, um, after I gave, like, it just took off, just blew up. Yeah. And we just were getting like thousands of followers every day. <laughs> and it was just wild. And I was like, come to Tampa, come to Dallas, come to here, come to there. And I was like, oh my gosh, would this be a good business idea? Like if I could actually scale these mixers, I think actually it could be cool. And I kind of got excited about it. And then I remembered, okay, but God, you called me to therapy. You mm -hmm. know, this is the dream you put in my heart. And just because something better comes along, I don't want to just throw that out the window. So here's the deal, God, <laughs> I'll let you know what's going to happen. <laughs> 
<laughs> if I get in, I will go. But if I don't get in, I'll take that as a closed door and an open door to if you know you're dating. And so, you know, it's, it's building followers, followers. And then I get the letter in February and I didn't get in. So I was like, yes. Wow. I was kind of stoked. I was like, I know it's going to happen at some point or something. You know, I'm going to learn more, but not right now. And so I was like, okay, let's do this. How are we going to do this? And I just remembered, you know, kind of putting feelers out there. Of like, does anybody want to intern or does anybody you know, want to do any volunteering or um, whatever. And just the, the messages poured in people being like, I can offer this talent, that talent. We had somebody doing a lot of, just like a lot of free services for us on, on all different fronts and just God's provision there. And then I remember someone reached out to me and she said, where can I donate? And I was like, what? And she's like, donate money. And I was like, this isn't a charity just so you know, like, thank you so much. But I just want you to know it's not a nonprofit. It's not a ministry, like it's a ministry, but you know, and um, I just want to make sure there wasn't any confusion. She's like, no, I know. I think what you're doing is so great. And I just want to help. I'm a business owner too. I know how it can be. And, oh. like, oh <laughs> and so I was like, well, here's my Venmo. And she's like, great. Within an hour, $500 was in my Venmo. I was oh like, my goodness. I never met this woman. She's only living in San Diego. Like never met this woman in my life. I have no mutual friends. Good. And she just like, I just felt like God was sending me to do it. And I was like, you're such a good dad. That's the thing. He's our dad. Like, he's a good dad that like, not the dad that it's like, you need to figure it out on your own. Mm-hmm. Or like, I'm going to withhold from you so that you can learn how to do it. Although I'm sure sometimes he does. And it, it, it teaches us, but he knows exactly what we need when we need it. If he needs us to learn a, a hard lesson, mm-hmm. we can trust that like, okay, this is actually been, this is being done with so much love. And this is actually the best thing for me in this moment. Mm-hmm. And other times he's like, I want to give you an egg instead of a rock. You know, like, I want to give you a good gift and I want to give you $500 because like you need it. And I'm going to provide, like, I'm not going to call you to something that I'm not going to foot the bill for. Right. And it was just, yeah, it was just so cool. And so I'm, um, I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is so clearly where God wants me to be. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, just launching in, in different cities and, um, yeah, so that that's wow. It's kind of in a nutshell. Girl. I mean, that's more my story behind it. Uh, a little bit I less about it. the actual business itself, but um, I love yeah. it. Like, oh my goodness, it's, I feel like we're going to need to do, well, and we're going to do a warrior conversation too, and dive into some of the relationship stuff. We might have to do a whole other story on if you know, you know, and cause it's, and I, I follow if you know, you know, as well. And so it's always fun to just <laughs> see the community, um, get to meet people through it. It's incredible. So I am yeah. just so proud of you for trusting God. Um, you. yeah, you just, you inspire me. If somebody was like watching your story and they're like, I want to connect with Mel. I want to connect with, if you know, you know, I want to be the first to hear about this coaching. She kind of leaked a little bit today. Where can people connect with you online? They can go to Instagram. It's I Y K Y K dot dating and, um, shoot us a DM and let us know if you're interested in, um, either potential coaching or, um, you know, even following us and then also getting, getting involved in our Facebook group. It's over 4,000 people right now. It's <laughs> wild. It grows. It's been growing so fast, like literally a thousand people in like one month. It's just crazy. And it's so cool. Cause there's people all, all the time, you know, there's even been like a split off of, um, Southern California ladies and it, cool. it's just starting to split. And, and we're going to, oh, in the plans, um, have you, have you heard the app telegram before? No, I haven't. Okay. I haven't heard of it either. Apparently, I don't know. Someone told me about it, but we're going to think of a way that we can start doing kind of like breakouts of, cool. you know, if you know, you know, Texas, if you know, you know, San Diego, That's you know, so that cool. we can start filtering people into these groups so they can start just doing their own community hangouts and, you know, and, and really trying to shift the focus from just dating mm-hmm. to community building and, and almost like a singles networking because awesome. we want to take the pressure off of like the dating. And I mean, there's so much more to it, but just even heal the relationship between men and women and who, who are single and aren't married because this church, you know, in our day growing up, there was very much like stay away from boys. Don't focus on the boys. Hang out with your girlfriends only. Yeah. You know, and, and then it created this like unhealthy divide that then they grew up as adults and they don't have any friends that are the opposite gender. And, and it's like, how are you going to meet your boyfriend or your husband if you don't even know any guys that are single? Like, right. how do you expect? And you're not online. You're not, you know, it's just there's so many different things. So this community has been really cool that people can just facilitate friendships and um, connections. And we've had a few relationships. That's 
awesome. I love it. I literally love what you're doing so much. And like, there's new people introducing themselves in the Facebook group. Every time I get on Facebook, I'm like, wow, all these people. Oh my gosh. It's yeah, awesome. Like 60 posts to approve a day. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. Y'all, we will have the links for you to easily connect in the show notes um, with Mel. And if you know, you know, but like, seriously, you inspire and encourage me. You're amazing. Um, Many more conversations to come, but thank you for sharing your story today. You're awesome. Thanks for having me.